Hello and welcome to Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College. I am Mike Substelny, once again here as your instructor this semester. Today we are going to be talking about a topic that is not covered in either of your textbooks. We're going to be talking about social games. It is an evasive and elusive topic that is very broad in scope, but it's extremely exciting because of its implications for the computer games industry. Let's get started right away. Last time we talked about games having objects and objects having properties and behaviors and relationships to each other. And we talked about the concept of emergence, where simple rules yield complex behaviors, sometimes intended by the game designer, sometimes not intended by the game designer. Um, today we're going to start with some shocking headlines for those of us in the game developing biz, such as Real Networks closing its uh, internal game studio a few years back, and uh, Radical Entertainment uh, cutting its staff by 50%, and I believe it's more than that now, and Simbin filing for bankruptcy, lots of turmoil in the gaming industry, although turmoil has always been there. And uh, THQ filing Chapter 11 and selling four studios. Well, at the same time, there were positive headlines lately. Zynga got $180 million from a single investor a few years back. Um, Microsoft offered $200 million for Crowdstar. And Playfish made a deal for $200 million. And the U.S. social gaming market was forecast to grow by $1 billion. And then we got more confusing news. Investors started abandoning social games. Uh, One Live was liquidated for 4.8 million. Zynga shares plummeted by 75% last year. And C yet CGA forecast $800 billion or $8 billion by uh, 2014 this year. Let's talk about these social games, this crazy, crazy phenomena that keeps making all these headlines and ups and downs. Um, they're games that allow players to interact socially. Uh, like baseball is a social game. And Car Town, also a social game. Chess, in a way, is a social game. Pa players are interacting with each other in these games. Um, oh, here's one, Toontown, uh, and uh, any massive multiplayer online game. I think Toontown no longer exists. It's now supported by just fans, so uh, very big with kids. Um, let's talk about multiplayer online first-person shooters, Star Wars Battlefront 2, a social game where you can play head-to-head -head as teams against each other. Um, asymmetrical multiplayer Co-op Space Team played on mobile apps. I've got Space Team on my phone. A very unusual game where uh, two players have different control panels that are kind of synchronized to each other, and they will get instructions of what needs to be done, and one player will find out they have to activate their wrench tripod. Well, the other player has the wrench tripod on their mobile device. Meanwhile, they're getting the instruction to increase extra beacon to one, whereas the other player has the extra beacon control. So they have to keep calling out these instructions and both searching their control panels in order to uh, cooperate together. It's a fast-paced, exciting, and kind of a crazy game um, to keep your uh, spacecraft going. Uh, then there's a multiplayer asymmetrical LBE, a location-based entertainment. Uh, Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator is the example we're going to use in this class, um, where you are the crew controlling a spaceship that is defending the galaxy against evil aliens, typically. Although you can also play this uh, player versus player. And that is an example of a Starship Bridge setup. That's actually the bridge setup uh, in my home that's always there where the players have different control screens that each does a different thing at the same time. And they must cooperate with each other. They must interact socially. They cannot function independent of each other. You cannot play this game by yourself. There are much better space games if you want to play it by yourself. 
All right, let's talk about a multiplayer asymmetrical virtual reality game. Keep talking and nobody explodes. This was recently made at a game jam. Pretty cool concept. So using the Oculus Rift VR goggles, uh, let's go back to the, the history of this game. They were realizing when they brought out their Oculus Rift goggles that a crowd formed around them that wanted to see what was going on with the Oculus Rift goggles. They couldn't possibly have enough goggles for the entire crowd to participate in any game. But they realized, we can make a game where the people who don't have goggles can work with the person who does have goggles on to accomplish something. So they created this game where there's a bomb that needs to be diffused in here. And there are these papers throughout the room with instructions on bomb diffusing. And the players not wearing goggles would pour over these papers and try to figure out frantically what the player with the goggles on needs to do to keep everybody from exploding. And this game turned out to be a lot of fun. And it required uh, lots of players, but only one set of goggles. Although you could probably adapt a game like that with several sets of goggles. And uh, that's a great, great social game concept. And it's just been invented in the last couple of months. All right, now let's talk about casual social games because they have been making a lot of money for a, a while now uh, when managed correctly. Uh, casual social games have simple rules, require low skill to very low skill level, and have a very low commitment. What do I mean by that? Well, a formal game that is the opposite of this, baseball, has complex rules, requires high skill, and a very high commitment to play. Whereas a casual game like Car Town, very simple rules, uh, very low skill, and very low commitment, but you do get to interact with your friends in the game. Uh, let's talk about the world of casual social gaming. Um, it kind of brought popped open when PopCap commissioned a study by Information Solutions Group, I think in 2010. They wanted to find out things like who plays social games? When do they play their social games? Why do they play their social games? And things like that. So they had 1,202 people in the United States and United Kingdom answer 41 questions about their social gaming habits. I think this was the first time anybody ever really delved into this. And what they got was fascinating. The social gaming phenomenon. First of all, let's look at the age of social gamers. This bar down here is the under 18 years old bar, which is where we think a, normally think a huge population of game players is. This bar here is 18 to 21. Well, which bars are really high? 30 to 39, 40 to 49, and 50 to 59. Even the 60 plus is 16 times higher than the under 18. They were tapping into a market that a lot of gaming companies didn't think existed at the time. Because so many games were aimed at the younger audience there. Let's look at the gender of social gamers. This was also shocking to them. Females outnumbered males in the playing of social games. Uh, that goes counterintuitively to many people in the gaming business. So they looked into uh, the questions about who are the social gamers, and they found out most of the social gamers have full-time jobs. Most have played their, their game for over a year and continue to play it regularly. Only 6% of social gamers were students in high school, college, post-grad, or whatever. 57% did not graduate from college, at least in the U.S. And 28% have spent real-world currency for game currency. And this is significant to us. 28%, according to this study, are willing to spend real world money 
in-app purchases, they're called. Okay, and then they asked about the reasons for the social gaming. 53% said, I like the fun and excitement. And if you'll notice that these numbers don't add up to 100%, it's because you could have checked more than one reason for social gaming. So a lot of people checked that they got fun and excitement out of it, that it was a stress reliever, that it, they enjoyed the competitive spirit, gave them a mental workout, and it allowed them con to connect with others in their social network. Actually, only 24% said connecting with others in their social network. And um, if you can't read this uh, chart, that's okay. It is available in ANGEL, the entire uh, survey. There's a link to the entire study in ANGEL. Um, so you can read every page of it if you want to. Fascinating data in there. So you've got a bunch of people who are getting fun and excitement out of playing these games. And this is also very significant for the world and our social structure in general, I would say, maybe less for us. Activities that social gamers have reduced in order to find time for social gaming. Number one activity they reduced was reading a book, magazine, or newspaper. Number two was watching television or movies at home. Number three, surfing the internet. Then exercising or playing sports. So they're exercising less, they're reading less, they're watching television less, but they're playing these social games. Now, reading a book, magazine, or newspaper falling, uh, falling away as one of their activities is pretty significant if you're, uh, let's say, a Nora Roberts somebody writing books that are aimed at that demographic of uh, a large number of females that are in that older age group there. Giving up reading, huh, to play social games. What is it about these social games that's attracting them? What itch is, are they scratching here? All right, let's look at the games they were playing in this, uh, oh, why is the second game not listed? Okay, Farmville was number one back then. And you could see a lot of familiar names. Many of these still exist. Uh, some of them don't anymore um, since 2010. But they're all still fairly popular Facebook social games. So let's look at the internet gaming success story of 2010, Farmville, which they lift, list in the beta for a long time. What did it take to build this crazy successful game? Building Farmville took Zynga five weeks. That's just it. Five weeks to launch this game. It took 15 to 20 people. Their investment in this game is estimated between 100,000 and 300,000 uh, based on the uh, article in Gamma Sutra where they uh, made this estimate and published this. So let's talk about the history of Farmville. June 19th, 2009, they launched this game. In nine weeks, it drew 11 million, million players. How did it spread so fast? Well, there were nonstop notifications on Facebook. It used kind of a mechanic that uh, was new at the time. There were messages that came from your Facebook friends. They didn't seem like advertisements. And even non-players could get these messages if you sent them. And since they were coming from real friends, they seemed attractive. They lured people into clicking and installing that app in their Facebook. All right. The game mechanics of Farmville. You harvest, you plant, and you plow by clicking on little squares on a grid. And that's it. That's it. You just click on squares on a grid and do some shopping occasionally. Well, could Zynga keep up that pace? Players got tired of grinding, and yes, just clicking on squares on a grid, most gamers would define as grinding. Zynga learned from Farmville and so developed Cityville to have a little bit more nuanced game mechanics. They used Farmville to launch Cityville and make it grow even faster than Farmville had. Let's talk for a moment about Metcalfe's Law, because that'll come into play here on the spreading of a game. Metcalfe's Law says the value of a network 
is proportional to the square of the number of connections in that network. So when you've got some players that are connected to each other in Facebook, if you double the number of players in your game, that network is four times more valuable to you in spreading your game. Well, with Facebook, they had a lot of connections. Zynga started Cityville with an enormous network created by Farmville already. So let's see what happened. This network got more and more complicated. They had everything they needed to launch something huge. They launched it in early December of 2010. So this is a year and a half after they launched Farmville. By January 20th, it had achieved 101 million monthly active users, MAUs. And 20 million, 381, 116, daily active users, DAUs. That is a lot of users. 20 million people playing your game every day. This, all, this comes from app data, a very interesting data source for you if you're going to be in this business. So how does that add up for Cityville? Well, Zynga doesn't publish all of their numbers, but we can speculate based on what we know. We know 28% of this demographic are willing to spend money. If you've got 20 million daily users, that means 5.6 million users per day are willing to spend real cash in your game. Whip out their credit card and buy something, make an in-app purchase. 5.6 million every single day. If the average person were just spending a penny a day, that would be, and this is a number we don't know, I just threw in a penny as a small amount of money. If the average person is spending a penny a day times 5.6 million people, that game is making $560,000 a day. We don't know that it is. Um, they didn't publish this. This is just speculation. So let's talk about the game mechanics of Farmville and what they learned about that. All right, players earn experience points um, doing their farming, and they level up. Familiar things that you've seen in many games. And they get Farmville experience points from growing some crops. In Cityville, they got experience points from growing cop crops, collecting rent, running businesses, helping each other, etc. And you can see an animation running here of uh, what's going on in, in Cityville. You can see kind of like Lego Star Wars in Cityville, I've got a whole bunch of things to pick up. My... Uh, businesses and such generate these things popping out of them. I'm harvesting money from that, collecting the rent, and out pops these things that I have to pick up. There's a lot more to run around, a lot more to engage me than there was in Farmville. This seems a lot less like grinding, even though it kind of is grinding. But it's much more exciting and interactive grinding. There's more to see. There's more going on in Cityville to keep me attracted and keep me coming back. All right, so in Farmville and Cityville, both have multiple in-game currencies, and they have many other resources. We talked about resources. We talked about currencies in past lectures. And both have numerous sub-goals, and both have no final goal. Your farm, they hope, will keep going forever and ever and ever, and you will visit it every day forever and ever and ever. And your city, they hope you will visit every day forever and ever and ever. As in, there are crops to harvest, just like Farmville in Cityville. But the harvesting process is a lot more interactive. I'm going to move on to the next slide here. All right, both have the requirement that you must interact with your Facebook friends to be successful. You can't not help each other harvest your crops or help each other or sending tourists to visit each other's cities and things like that and continue to advance in experience points and levels. You will stall out if you just try to sit there by yourself 
in Farmville or Cityville or any of this whole genre of games. And that gives you the, uh, and there you're just seeing uh, visiting another, here I am visiting my own city actually in this case a couple of years ago. And you can see uh, it's like building a model railroad and having the chance to show it off. You build buildings and things and businesses and sidewalks and architectural features and your friends get to come and visit your city and it's like showing it off. So you want it to look cool like it's your own model railroad and they want theirs to look cool because they know you're going to come and visit it. That's part of using the social network to keep you coming back to play the game. Um, your friends can come and they help you. They help collect, harvest, they can guide your ships, they can send tourist buses to help your economy and that also helps their economy. The more they inter you interact with your friends and they interact with you, the more successful all of you are. And that game mechanic um, is built into all of this genre of games. It's part of the uh, game mechanics of all these Facebook social games. You can give gifts to your friends. They don't cost you anything, but your friends would have to pay if they wanted to acquire them without you. Um, a lot of uh, Facebook social games give you the opportunity. Here's a movie pop. It's a recent addition to the Facebook social games in the last uh, year or so, where you watch movie clips and compete against uh, your friends to try and guess what movie it's from fastest. Uh, kind of like Name That Tune was a long time ago. And you get to gra brag about your victories on Facebook when you, have a, when you win a round or something like that. And that appeals to a lot of these uh, Facebook players. And uh, Song Pop, another example of that same game mechanic, where you can challenge your friends to, uh, well, this is, an, this is exactly a name that tune kind of game. How fast can you figure out what the tune is or who the artist is? And Movie Pop is uh, the newer example of that. And uh, the same mechanic is used in mobile app games. Here's a game of Scrabble going on that you can play on a a smartphone or draw something. Draw something's been a big hit for a couple of years now. Uh, a lot of people like drawing and this is a little bit different because it's uh, draw something is kind of a co-op game because you uh, you only succeed if your opponent also succeeds and so they uh, Zynga who makes this one also if you read their advertising they brag about how it's a funny game. They brag about that it's humorous to look at the drawings made by your friends and it's humorous to look at the guesses they make to try and figure out what your drawing represents. They don't talk up the, uh, the victory and glory of winning this game because, again, you only succeed in this game if your opponent also succeeds. Or opponents, you can't have multiple opponents. All right, let's look at Zynga's ideas behind the creation of Farmville and Cityville. Zynga founder Mark Pincus said in a CNN interview that he wanted to create simple games that people liked but could easily set aside if they wanted to. He said they built the game so that they could be played in a tab in your browser, say, while you're on a conference call or something like that. See that, that low commitment level we were talking about? He set out to fill a surprising void, he thought, in most people's daily internet use. He knew a lot of people were on the internet, but they weren't playing a lot of games. He thought in 2007 that something had gone oddly wrong with the whole internet experience. He would have thought games would have been one of the top two or three experiences people had on the internet. And at the time, they were not. And so uh, an interview with Zynga chief Brian Reynolds, uh, said that you have to get the social right in order to get anything else. Improve your social mechanics and then add the fun into the bucket, was his thinking. And he said that we make the link between virtual goods and real world social relationships. If you don't understand that, you're not going to succeed in social games. And that's how they made money with these games. Let's now talk about David McCraney who uh, looked into uh, how 
the, the psychology of these games and Teague Kelly on engagement. All right. David McCraney wrote in his book, The Sunk Cost Fallacy, the more you invest in, I'm sorry, an article, The Sunk Cost Fallacy, the more you invest in something, the harder it is to let go of it. And you will find a link to this article in Angel. That's part of your reading for this week, since we don't have a textbook reading. He said that these games make it easy to invest in a quick return for the future, and then do it again. Um, let's talk about Teague Kelly's engagement hierarchy, where he talked about distraction, amusement, connection, meaning, and culture. Let's give the definitions of these. A distraction. All right, you've, everybody's seen this come across. Tomorrow, Facebook will change its privacy settings to allow Mark Zuckerberg to come into your house while you're asleep and eat your brains with a sharpened spoon. You've heard these things. It's a cute little thing to engage you for a few seconds, or distract you for a few seconds that somebody puts across your social media, whatever it is. The next thing is amusement, like uh, very low commitment games like Tetris or Bejeweled, Bejeweled Blitz. Let's talk about connection now, where it's not just a momentary attention, but uh, a lingering relationship. It lasts with the game and the game's world. In this case, Star Wars Battlefront II or possibly Bridge, a game you want to stay with and stick with because it's got a world that you can immerse yourself in. Meaning is the next thing where the special it has special significance to the player, an internal desire to become a master of the game. And... Now culture, where the game becomes a part of the culture, a topic of common conversation, like baseball or any of the Halo games, really. This is Halo 3 that we have for you in the library, but any of the Halo games, they're part of the culture. A lot of the words in Halo are now just part of our common vernacular. So most casual games can never get above amusement. They will never reach any of those high levels like the other games we were just looking at. So being first is very important. Um, Farmville was uh, first. Uh, Car Town was first. I'm sorry, is that Cityville? That's Cityville. And they, the look-alike games were always less successful. And Railroad Empire also first. All right. And uh, we look at the things people have given up, the reading a book, magazine, or a newspaper, and uh, watching TV and surfing the internet as uh, businesses that are probably in decline somewhat because of these games. Now, let's look at uh, May 2013 data of what the top games were from this app data survey. We can see Candy Crush Saga, Farmville 2, Texas Hold'em, um, you should, if you're interested in uh, this industry, become very familiar with what app data publishes. I didn't put any 2014 data in this. I probably should have. Um, the leaderboard here shows uh, uh, Chefville, Texas Hold'em, Farmville 2, Zynga Sligo as uh, leaderboard by... Um, monthly daily users, daily average users, and the ratio of daily average users to monthly average users. And uh, top 25 Facebook games last year, Candy Crush Saga, Farmville 2, Texas Hold'em Poker. You could see the companies that were the, the leaders there. Kling came up with this Candy Crush Saga. And boy, I haven't mentioned Candy Crush Saga uh, except for right here as this one came out of nowhere and jumped on top of Zynga. This one spread like wildfire using that same darn game mechanic of sending notifications to your friends. And even though people became jaded and became sick of those notifications and start threatening each other on Facebook if you don't stop sending these notifications, this mechanic still works for spreading a game. All right. And players do still spend an awful lot of time on social games. Um, the question is, how do you make money with that? Well, in-app purchases seem to still be a good way to make money, 
Advertising uh, seems to still be a way to make money. Selling the game doesn't seem to be uh, something that works. Except there are some games that are going straight to tablet um, where people might uh, pay for the social application. Um, and I think you pay for, like, uh, well, Artemis you pay for, and um, uh, what was that other one we talked about? Space Team. Space Team is one. You buy that app, and that is a whole lot of fun, very casual. So uh, that's also a way that people are making money with these. We're winding down now. Next time, we're going to talk about playtesting of games. I hope there were useful things in today's uh, conversation for you. We will continue this conversation online when we talk about social games, and hopefully by the end of the term you will experience some social games. So until next week, this is Mike Substelny signing off for Intro to Computer Games and Simulations at Lorain County Community College.